We did 50 projects in our first year and did shows like Game of Thrones and League of Legends. We launched Kitbash and 24 hours later, someone posted their first image that they made using one of our kits. That became the addiction. That became like why we wanted to pour all of our effort into this. This is Max Berman, an artist turned entrepreneur in the VFX industry who started off as a matte painter, who then developed one of the most prominent asset libraries in the VFX industry, which is now being used by the world's largest studios and companies, including Disney, Marvel, HBO, and even Epic Games. That was a huge learning experience, super painful learning experience made every mistake you could make you guys have basically solved one of the biggest problems in 3d when it comes to asset management we believe in fortnite as an ecosystem we think that they're in such great position with unreal engine max welcome to the bad decisions podcast thank you so much for having me no worries man it's a pleasure to have you here and first off i think the best way to open this up because we've been stalking kit bash 3d is Again, this is the first time we're having an official conversation together, face to face online. We got to say congratulations on the vehicles kit. That looked super cool, super awesome. And it was a genius idea. I mean, after all the crazy structures and buildings you guys have and the weapons going into vehicles, we cannot wait to see what else you guys will add. Oh, thank you. It's it's been a, a long time coming. We've been working on our vehicles pipeline and building our vehicles teams out for the last two years. Um, oh, wow. And, you know, really a, a big part of that was just, hey, if we're going to do vehicles, we want to do the best vehicles we possibly can. We want to build enough of them to have a, a runway, to have consistent releases every single month mm -hmm. in a variety of genres. So mm -hmm. uh, for us, we're, we're just so excited that it's finally out in the world and now we can start adding to it. Yeah, I, I, I mean, for anybody who's a crazy car fan, I, I just cannot imagine how much they're waiting and refreshing the button on, on kit batches every month to see if there's going to be anything new. Because again, vehicles is just a whole other ball game, right? And I cannot imagine how long you guys have been planning that out. So definitely something we're going to talk about today. And I just want to give like a quick intro to everybody who's listening and watching. Of course, you are the co-founder of Kitbash 3D, which is one of the coolest, most powerful online libraries for 3D assets, right? premium assets for video games and for movies. And we are definitely going to talk about the current state of Kitbash 3D and where it's going to go in the future because you guys also announced the partnership with Fortnite and UEFN, which we're crazy about. You know, that, that future itself is going to require some deep conversation. But at the same time, we have to not forget that the entrepreneur Max is not what you've always been, right? Prior to that, you were the creative Max who was a, a matte painter, right, for many, many years. And we checked out your work online. You have worked on some of the craziest titles. And we didn't even know. We checked it out. We we're like, I remember that shot from Titanfall 2. I remember that from Game of Thrones. We were just checking that out. The tents, like all those things, which I definitely recommend because we're going to leave the, the link in the description, everybody to check out. So watching all of that, I guess we have to take it, you know, all the way back to when you first started as a matte painter. And maybe even if you think that it's right to go before that, we can. We just want to know how your journey began. And if you don't mind to also begin with a little bit of a, a description of what a matte painter does for anybody in the audience that might not be aware of that term, I would really appreciate that. Sure. Um, and thank you for, for all the kind words. Um, yeah, for, for those who don't know what matte painting is, um, matte painting is a, a, a pretty... Um, historical craft, I'd say, you know, it predates 3D and CGI. And uh, one of the first special effects, we're talking early 1900s, actually predates film into the, the uh, era of illusionists and magicians. Mm -hmm. It's, it's a it's a crazy craft. And basically, where matte painting started was, um, you'd paint an environment on a pane of glass, and you'd put a mm -hmm. camera up against the glass and uh, you just would paint around whatever you wanted to film. And so that was how you did a special effect to put someone in a different world. Um, and then that's kind of evolved over the last hundred years and um, turned into digital uh, using Photoshop to do uh, 2D paintings of giant environments and then moved more and more into 3D. Um, but the craft itself is about how do we create an environment that doesn't exist to help tell a story. Mm -hmm. And no, first of all, I just want to say, so me and Farhad, we have never tried matte painting, of course. <laughs> and we weren't even familiar with the term until just, you know, a few months back. But just understanding the, the, the 
the craft that goes behind it and how it was used as an illusion. Again, I definitely recommend people to go check out like the history of it because that itself, the evolution of it is crazy. But did you always know that you're going to be a mad painter? Maybe when you were in high school, I, I guess it's not like a usual thing because when we, we saw another podcast from you, you said that the, the trait and the experience of a mad painter is something that is passed on, right? And it, it's not like widely accessible. At least maybe now, I guess in 2024, it might be online. But at a time when you started... We just want to take it back and see how it first came to be for you to become a matte painter. Sure. Yeah, I, I did not know what matte painting is, and it, it is very much the uh, apprentice system. So mm -hmm. matte painters would pass down their skills through an apprentice system. Um, and I, I knew I wanted to be an artist working in movies and games. And mm -hmm. uh, I loved painting, and I loved painting environments. And when I was at a, a studio, someone looked at my portfolio and went, oh, you're a map painter. And I just nodded my head like, <laughs> yeah, that's exactly okay. what I am. Uh, so I looked it up online, like, what is map painting? And started to learn more about what that trade means. And then mm -hmm. at the same time, my first studio job, this legendary oil and glass map painter named Sid Dutton started at the studio and took me on as mm -hmm. his apprentice. Um, so he really taught me a lot of the history, a lot of the techniques. He would bring in his old oil and glass map paintings and show me them and how he would work with those. And uh, at that stage, we were doing everything digitally, but got to learn from, you know, a, a true master of the craft. Mm -hmm. That's really awesome. Wow. What are the tools that you were using at that time for matte painting? What are the, were there softwares that you were using at that time? It was almost exclusively Photoshop at that time. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that was during, there was like a, quite a transition where some people were still doing traditional map painting techniques, moving into mm -hmm. Photoshop. And, you know, that was right during that transition and well before, you know, 3D came into the picture. Right. Oh. And this is uh, technically, were you telling me that you were already creating all these landscapes in Photoshop, and that's why they told you, oh, you're, you're a matte painter. Like, what you're doing is already technically that. Yeah, throughout high school, I was always doing online competitions and challenges of, like, Photoshop challenges and design challenges mm -hmm. and trying to create these, um, you know, big environments in Photoshop, and I, I just didn't know that what the term for it was. Right. That's awesome. So technically, right after college, you went ahead and started working in the VFX and film industry. Is that how it played out for you? I, I, went, I didn't go to college, so I went right after high right. school. Um, I okay. started at uh, Zoic Studios when I was 18 and mm -hmm. then just worked through that. Wow. Wow. Is the foundation of Kitbash 3D, is the, all the years that you worked in studios as a matte painter, did the idea came about at those times for Kitbash as well? Definitely, you know, some of the ideas came out of that. Um, you know, a big part of, towards the end of my map painting career, things were moving more and more into 3D. And I was always struggling with finding great assets that were at the quality we needed, finding a cohesive set of assets. So uh, you'd go to an online marketplace and find one asset that worked really well, but you couldn't find the next two or three. Uh, so that was always a pain point and I would hire modelers to help me when I was on you know, projects to say, hey, I need just a set of these things. Um, so that was part of it. Uh, the other part for Kit Bash was Banks, my co-founder and I, um, we had kind of been working in Hollywood for a decade and had been friends. But that whole time we were talking about 2025 and the metaverse and how much we wanted to work on that. And we said, oh, we're 10 years too early or 15 years too early. Uh, and so we, we were always talking about what are the things that are going to enable a 3D internet to happen. And we believed game engines were going to be at its core. And we believed that people who were using 3D technology at the time were going to be the ones in the best position to have an impact on that. Uh, mm -hmm. And so we were always looking at how do we support that community. And this kind of intersected really well with that. Wow. So... Would you say the idea of Kitbash 3D then came to you guys somewhere in the last 10 years? Because I, I mean, we're in 2024 now. You're saying that you were looking at 2025 and you guys were sort of trying to create that idea. So I'm guessing Kitbash 3D, the idea originated probably about 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, we were, we, we started our first company called We Are Fuzzy uh, because it was okay. a little fuzzy what we were going to do. <laughs> um, okay. 
I had uh, I had been making a video game on Unreal at the time, like an indie game with a friend, and uh, was about to go off uh, to publishers. Mm -hmm. And then Banks and I said, well, why don't we try to self-publish this? So we, we used Fuzzy as a publishing company. And we were the first Unreal game to port to Nintendo Switch. And so we walked wow. into E3 and like had our game on the Switch and we're ready to like show a bunch of people and excited for this to come out in the fall. And right when we walked in, a Pokemon game and a Mario game got announced on oh, the same no. week as our release. <laughs> oh man. So we just- What did you guys do? We turned right around. I think we were like five steps into E3 and we're like, <laughs> saw the notification on our phone and just turned right around and just went for a walk in downtown LA. and. Oh, said, no. hey, we got to figure out something else. Like, we got to delay the game like at least a year because now we're into fall AAA season. And this is a tiny indie game. Um, and so we sat down at a coffee shop and we we're saying, what, what are we going to do to to bide our time? Uh, and that's when we started talking about, you know, Kip Ash and this idea of, hey, you know, I'm always hiring modelers to help me with this thing. I think this is a big mm -hmm. need for creators in this community. Uh, what if we tried to build a couple kits and launch those the same day as we were going to launch the video game? Uh, and maybe that can, you know, buy us some more time until we get the game out. Mm. Um, so we did that three months later, we launched Kit Bash. Um, and about a year later, we launched the game. But by the time the game came out, it was such an afterthought for us uh, because Kit Bash had just consumed us. But was Kit Bash also working from the beginning in a sense that you were like, okay, this this other baby that I have, because I'm treating these businesses as babies, right? Because you really have to feed them all of your energy, all of your time. Was Kit Bash working from the beginning to the point that you guys were like, okay, this is what we need to pay attention to, whereas the game, you know, we thought would be the the, the main, but this is now becoming the main. Well, I think what happened, and it was a little unexpected, we launched Kit Bash and. 24 hours later, someone posted their first image that they made using one of our kits. Oh, that and, must have felt good. And when we saw that, it was just, we became addicted to that. It just right away, oh my God, look at what someone made with this. That is so much cooler and a better feeling than anything that we'll make for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so th that became the addiction. That became like why we wanted to pour all of our effort into this. Um, but in terms of Kitbash working, you know, we were we were really scrappy and, you know, we've always been profitable, but I wouldn't say it was like we launched and then it was, holy shit, this thing works. <laughs> you know, it, I think the first day we got like one or two sales and mm -hmm. like, oh, this is this is going to be a long road here. Um, it's going to take us some time to actually lift this thing up. But, you know, it, I just want to say it's beautiful because the, the feeling of enabling other artists is what gave you guys the addiction. That, that's really beautiful. Was it the drive of, you know, starting Kitbash 3D and then expanding the team and now having thousands of different assets? What was the drive behind, you know, expanding the team so fast and having all these assets after these years? You know... It's funny, it doesn't feel fast from the other <laughs> side. Uh, when we first launched, we set a cadence for ourselves of we want to release a new kit every month. And the yeah. idea there was we want this library to expand. We want it to have a, a wide variety of genres that will accommodate any project. And we want to go really mm -hmm. deep in the most common genres to give the most possible assets for those things. Mm -hmm. And you know, we couldn't just go and build 10,000 assets right away. So we said, well, how do we do this um, on a sustainable but consistent pace and knowing that if we just release one kit each month and we do that for enough time, we will build you know, the library that that's, we believe is needed here. You know, I love that. It's like, it's like going to the gym, right? It happens every day. If you want to get fit, it's not like you go one, one day time. and you try to burn 5,000 calories you have to go every single day 30 minutes a day is fine so that's how you guys treated the same uh you guys treated kit bash really it's like every month we'll release one did you guys manage to stick to that schedule or did, was there any months where you guys uh couldn't deliver the one month there were there's probably been like four five months in the last eight or seven years that we, oh, wow. we couldn't that's... do it uh, but there's also probably been especially after this year, but there's probably been, you know, 15 to 20 months where we put two kits out. 
So we've doubled up more than we've missed. Wow, that's, that's really amazing. But how do you come up with the ideas of all these different, because we went through and we started browsing. First of all, the naming convention is amazing. We really we, love it. Yeah. Like, who, who's doing the names, by the way? You, you guys should really g give that man a phrase. It's really great. A big part of that is Banks and I uh, on the okay. naming. Um, but a lot of that, you know, we didn't just want to create an asset pack. The, the idea behind this whole thing is we wanted to create an IP, a property that you could leverage for your world. And so the title is important. Equally, like the cover and the poster are super important. We bring in a guest artist every month to do the posters for all the kits. That's awesome. Um, in terms of coming up with the ideas, the first couple of years, it was, it was definitely Banks and I, and, and then different people on the team would have an idea. And sometimes it was like a no brainer idea. Other mm -hmm. times it would be, I don't know why that idea is going to work, but you're really excited about it. And if you're excited about it, other people will be. So let's go build that. Mm -hmm. Um, today it's evolved a lot more. We have a much bigger team. Mm -hmm. And so today the way it works is anyone in the company can pitch an idea for a kit. Uh, mm -hmm. they pull references, they put together like why this kit would be, um, would work well in the library, what other kits it would work with. Uh, mm -hmm. and then we have basically like criteria that we're looking for on those, mm -hmm. um, Anything that passes those criteria, they make it into a, a jam session. And so all of our concept artists a couple times a year will uh, take all the ideas that have been approved and just do a couple concepts on them. And we'll look at just a giant board of here's, you know, 30 different world ideas, a couple concepts of each. And then a lot of it becomes planning the slate. So, mm -hmm. hey, we have the next 12 months of releases. We don't want to just do sci-fi, 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 sci-fi. How do we want to mix this around to make sure there's something for everyone? Um, so it's, it's a bit of a process to, to try to get our programming and, and, you know, choose the right kits to build. But I, so I understand it, it must be difficult and challenging running this entire operation, but that very moment where you're looking at 20, 30 different genres of, you know, different ideas, concepts, that must be really fun, just looking at all these different worlds that can be brought into reality. And again, as 3D artists, everybody has a different taste, right? Or actually any artist. And when you just scroll through Instagram or ArtStation, you see all these different worlds people are creating, not just with kit batch, just, you know, from maybe they're drawing it, right? You can see that you have, you can create a kit for anybody, almost. So I don't think there's anything you guys can go wrong with. What you guys are doing absolutely right is definitely getting the posters and the naming and the font. Like when I, the, my most favorite interface is Netflix, if I were to choose, right? Just being able to go through different movies and being basically attracted to different parts of the screen and really wanted to click on them. I definitely feel that when I go through your guys's platform and it, it just reminds me of a certain game like i look at something and i'm like this reminds me of this game and even though it's not exactly the same it reminds me of that so you guys really do that part well and then when i go into the kit i'm like okay it makes sense now i'm looking at all these different things that i can put together to make up what i have in my mind so yes who, like the naming as far as the, the design and the poster they are both amazing it's on point thank you yeah our um, our senior graphic designer, Emily, does all the logos for all the kits. And that's mm -hmm. another one of my favorite parts of just seeing the, the logo proposals. So whenever it gets, when we're getting ready to release it, we'll see you know, the, the 10 different logos that could work for this kit and what mm -hmm. evokes the emotion. And uh, she always just knocks it out of the park. It's incredible. Wow. And then imagine now you have selected one kit and one idea for it to go forward. How do you guys define the definition of done? Is it 30 pieces, 50 pieces? How many, war how many castles you're gonna build? Because yeah. you guys have a very limited time frame, right? You wanna release one kit a month. Uh, but now is, there's more than one and, kit. And now it's more than a kit a month. So how do you guys define that? Yeah, um, yeah it's a little art, it's a little science. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the concept artists who are working on it, they, most of our concept artists have been with us for a while and they've designed a lot of kits. So we kind of know the gist of it. Uh, the goal for the, the, how much to build there is really around what would someone need to build out a full cohesive world around this theme? Uh, you know, and that's kind of like, where's the diminishing returns if there mm -hmm. were only four ca or four castles or four medieval village 
buildings, mm-hmm. like maybe that's not enough to actually create a scene. But if there were like mm-hmm. 200 of them, eh, that's kind of overkill. So yes. we're always trying to find that in between part. Um, and more and more today, we're focused on, yes, the structures and the architecture, but every kit has you know, between 100 to 200 props that set dress mm-hmm. that kit. And so we want to spend more and more time there because we believe uh, with the whole library, there's enough that works together architecturally that how do we give mm-hmm. things that can help add different flavor? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I figured, I don't know why, I figured the way you guys would test the kit is just have some of the artists try to build a whole world with that or just like try to create a cinematic or something to be like, okay, if somebody, if, if a couple of people here can pull it off, then everybody else can. Because technically that's that's how I imagine I would test them. That's why I think Farah was also yeah. asking the question, how do you guys make sure you're, it's done? Like this is enough for anybody to go and create, you know, multiple different variations of this world. Let's say like... Um, the brutalist pack that you guys have put out, right? Something like that. Yeah, I think we do most of that in concept design and all of our concept artists work in 3D as their base. So they'll Mm -hmm. block things out, but um, we try to be pretty confident in the kit by the time it goes into production. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Real quick, did you know that there's an app on your phone called Polycam that lets you take giant environments and turn them into photorealistic 3D scenes? You don't believe me, do you? We're talking as giant as Burj Al Arab. We wanted to recreate Burj Al Arab, so we literally went around it, scanned it using our phone and Polycam, brought it into Unreal Engine, and made this video. This tech is called Gaussian splatting, and it's unbelievable. This is just one of the cool things that we use Polycam for in our workflow, and there are thousands of people just like us taking in large environments and objects into their 3D scenes. I mean, just check this out. We got a city, we got like a castle, like a car, This is crazy. Now, we use Polycam in our videos all the time. And so we decided to talk to them to see if we can get you guys, the Bad Decisions fam, a sweet deal. And guess what? Right now, you can go to Polycam, sign up for a free account, and try to create your splats. But you'll have a 150 photo limit or a three minute video limit. If you go pro, however, you can take up to 1000 photos and 15 minute long videos. That means higher quality and accuracy in your captures and bigger environments. To go pro, you need to pay these amounts monthly or yearly. But if you go ahead and write the name Bad Decisions in the promo code tab, you get 30% off, baby. Mm-hmm. Link in the description. Let's get back into the pod. I want to just ask one question about the beginning again. When you said you guys were working on the game and then decided to go for the idea of Kit Bash, releasing Kit Bash, how many people was involved in the very beginning stage of Kit Bash 3D to bring it to a reality? Well, it was Banks and I, and then um, I freelanced out or I contracted out two modelers to build the first two kits, uh, first four kits actually. Um, and then we had uh, an intern who then became our, our marketing person. Um, and so it was really the three of us in a garage and then contracting out some kits uh, at the start. Wow. How big is the team now? We are, uh, I think, around 60 people now. Wow. wow. That, is, that is crazy. That is crazy. And if I were to ask you what your biggest challenge was, raising Kate Bash 3D to a full grown adult at this point, what would you say that was for you? Well, first of all, I still think we're in the teenage years. <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> well, you know, it depends on how you're seeing the future of it, which is what we're going to discuss as well. I absolutely agree, actually. Um, you know, every year has brought different challenges. Uh, just you know, the, the, the landscape has changed in the entertainment industry. Um, everything changes at scale. You know, a 10 person company is very different than a 20 person, very different than a 50 person. Um, there's always challenges. I think the, if I had to boil down like the one hardest challenge, I think it's endurance, you know, Mm -hmm. it's just being able to keep overcoming the next challenge over and over and over again. Uh, you know, that and probably patience of, you know, we've been talking about 2025 and we've been working on this for seven plus years and we're still not at the starting line. And so a lot of this is about being patient. Oh, wow. And then, okay, so when you were predicting about 2025, we are now one year from 2025. So how do you see that vision 
comes into reality. We just had Apple Vision Pro <laughs> being released. So I think we are really moving toward that direction. What is your thought about that? It's remarkable how everything has unfolded. Like everything has unfolded exactly how Banks and I thought it would, which is just mind blowing. Um, you know, AI procedural, that was something that back in 2018, we were like, hey, this is gonna be a real threat to us. How are we gonna prepare for this? Um, game engine technology moving to where it has, you know, in the beginning, people were like, why are you guys going so high poly with this? Like, this is never going to work for games. And we said, no, the poly counts aren't going to matter in 2025. Um, you know, graphics cards, mm -hmm. processing, yeah. latency, all of that hardware has gotten exactly where we need it to be. And then the biggest thing is 3D um, social networks, which is what we you know, believe is the, the foundation of, of the metaverse um, or the 3D internet. Uh, we're seeing things like Roblox now calling themselves a, a communication platform. We're seeing the mm -hmm. concerts on Fortnite and Fortnite grow into this, you know, ecosystem. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, 2025 is still, you know, I feel like we're on track for everything we thought was going to happen there. And, and really that for us, we said that we believe is going to be the year that's the starting line. You know, that's mm -hmm. not when all of this is done and out there. That's when this begins. Uh, so yeah, I still feel very confident that things are going to start I, next year. I absolutely agree with you. And I think that we definitely have to get your prediction and Banks' prediction again in case me and Farah need to plan for the next 10 years. <laughs> Since you guys were right about this one, we're going to count on what you're going to say on this podcast. Any, any prediction for 2030? <laughs> <laughs> and then we're going to invite you again in five years and we're going we're gonna to talk about this <laughs> moment. Um, but seriously, honestly, I don't know when... That, I don't, yes. we, did a, we did a talk at Nomen um, December, 2019 of like, Hey, we're going into the next decade and here's our predictions for the next decade. Um, so if you, if you want to see like the, the next 10 years, I still stand by everything we said in the, in that one. Um, and you know, for us, it's all about just being in position for it. Okay. If you were to mention one of those predictions that you think will be the biggest change for the next few years, what would it be? 3D the content. one that you're looking forward to. Yeah, 3D content as the user generated 3D content as the new dominant content form. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying is now most of the content on social media is 2D. We are looking at Instagram, we are looking at YouTube, mm -hmm. but what we are, I mean, this is a conversation that me and Faraz had a lot that it's time for people to consume 3D content. To when, when I'm sending something to you rather than sending a photo, maybe I can send that 3D asset so you can look at it from all the different angles. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening also, of course, with Apple Vision Pro and with all the new tools that happening right now? It's yeah, it's happening everywhere. And and I don't I think a lot of people confuse that with VR and AR. I think mm -hmm. that's just another way to consume it. Um, mm -hmm. But I think really it's this idea that user generated content is is the dominant content form today more than Netflix mm -hmm. or anything in Hollywood, right? YouTube mm -hmm. is, you know, miles beyond them in terms of amount of content and viewership and engagement. Yeah. Um, same with Instagram. Um, but, you know, we're seeing the younger generation, two out of uh, every three kids in America between nine and 12 are on Roblox. And that's their go to social platform. They're mm -hmm. not going to go backwards to a 2D social platform. They're going to grow mm -hmm. up and stay in a 3D platform. Um, mm -hmm. Now, these platforms need to age with them. And so you can see things like Fortnite going to the younger audience with Lego Fortnite and then expanding with things like Travis Scott concerts, trying to bring in the older audience. Um, Roblox is doing the same thing. You're seeing Gucci activations happening there. They're teaching fashion design in Roblox at Parsons School in New York. So mm. we're starting to see that age up start to happen. Uh, but yeah, 3D as the dominant content form, users being able to easily create 3D content and that being a driver of this ecosystem. Absolutely. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, the, we talked about this uh, between us as well, how you know people are enabling TikTok to exist. If TikTok was to create their own content, it would never have worked to this extent, right? It's only because there are millions of people I don't actually I don't know the exact number, but just there's just too much content, right? And it's because everybody's creating that content. And now with games like Roblox and Fortnite, with UEFN now allowing people to bring in their own assets, which we're super pumped about. We made a video when they announced it. 
we're actually creating our own Fortnite maps. And then we saw that you guys also announced your partnership with Fortnite. So let's talk about that. What is going on over there? And where are we in that partnership at this state? Is it something that is releasing very soon? Should we be looking forward to it over the next few weeks or months? Uh, I can't talk about release date, um, okay. but I can talk about what we're doing there. Um, we believe in Fortnite as an ecosystem. Uh, we think that you know they're in such great position with Unreal Engine and Fortnite together. UEFN is incredibly powerful. Um, one of the things that, that we can help bring to the table is photorealism in Fortnite. And as we talk about aging up an audience, that's really the goal there is how do we equip creators in UEFN with the tools to create photorealistic experiences, more adult experiences, things that maybe look more like, um, you know, Call of Duty rather than uh, Minecraft. And so, so we've been building uh, a ton. We have a ton of Fortnite kits that are specifically built for Fortnite, built with gameplay um, in mind. So everything is gameplay ready. Everything is, you know, we're basically optimized. becoming level designers and optimized. Mm-hmm. And um, the things that we've been building are just super cool to see. You know, the other day I saw one of our very realistic kits running on an Android phone. Uh, and it's Ooh. just mind blowing to see like triple A game please. quality in real time, 60 frames per second on a phone. Dude, that's like, that. that is the beauty of Unreal Engine, right? We. So we just recorded the tutorial series, a beginner tutorial series for Unreal Engine 5. Because our goal, our, our channel is mostly built on top of Unreal Engine because of what we produce with it. And we're just always amazed. Every single time we go in and we're seeing 120 frames running on an RTX 4090, of course, but 120 frames on millions of polygons because we're running Nanite. And then seeing that, and then now slowly being able to port all of that into UEFN, and we've done that multiple times now as, as a test. And it just, it, it's still crazy to see. But again, one of the biggest concerns is, yes, you can create that for Windows and for Mac. Um, I, Mac is still there, right? At yeah, this yeah, point, yeah. yeah. But how can you get it to run on an Android device, right? Because you need to care about all of these different platforms that Fortnite is available on. And so when you say that you guys have your assets tested on Android devices and they're running, I'm like, I'm super pumped about that. So you guys are creating multiple kits for Fortnite. So when it's released, it would be multiple kits at the same time. Yeah, yeah, we have. It's an entire new product line for us that is specifically built for Fortnite in partnership with them. Um, And yeah, we'll make sure, similar to the Kitbash library, that this covers you know a very wide array uh, array of genres. Mm. Oh, Max, we are building a map as we speak on Fortnite. We could really use some help on the, <laughs> <laughs> on the asset, but, but it's, it's exciting because, I mean, building Fortnite maps is something that me and Farah has really delved into. And knowing that you guys are releasing different styles, that would really help creators to create different styles mm. of Fortnite map based mm. on their audience. And I think that's really, really exciting. So, you, so those assets would be different from the assets that are currently in Kitbash 3D means they are optimized for UEFN and then like cargo, like how we use it, we could use them for Fortnite as well. But that will be on fab this time, right? That's correct. Yeah, the Fortnite uh, kits are, we call them KBFNs, uh, Kitbash Fortnites. K- oh, K- KBFN. Okay, I'm yeah. going to get used to that name. But they're they're going to come to fab um, and they are very different. We're, I mean, we're designing them in UEFN. So we're oh. making sure that, you know, a Fortnite character is different than a, a normal human scale. They need to yeah. be able mm-hmm. to go through the doors. We have, you know, need mm-hmm. to make sure that all the gameplay works for this. That um, and that the the structures themselves are built around a gameplay idea. And so mm-hmm. uh, they're all kind of level designed first. Um, mm-hmm. How do you how do you see the future of UEFN? I want to ask you because you guys are. One of the first, if not the first, I actually don't know, you know, the, the entire story behind how, um, you know, Epic Games is working with different partners to create these, uh, these packs. But I assume you guys being one of the most powerful in, in the world when it comes to having a premium library. How do you see that future laying out? As you said, now kids are playing Fortnite, teens, adults are playing Fortnite, and now you guys are enabling them to create their worlds. It'll be much quicker because now they don't need to 3D model anymore. There are the Fortnite assets, but again, we talked about this. Most of them are stylized. Now, you guys are allowing people to create anything they want, potentially. 
how do you see that future of um, you know p- people like yourself enabling people in 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 UEFN? It's yeah, great. I think it's a new, it's an entire new generation of creators and uh, a new audience. And I think the goal here is that anyone can be a creator, not just a consumer of this content. And traditional 3D software today is still too complex for most people to go through the learning curve to pick it up. Uh, mm. Fortnite's build system is really intuitive. You know, it's something that anyone can pick up and create something and has a built-in distribution network. Uh, Epic's done an amazing job with profit sharing and making this, you know, a viable business move. Uh, I think if you're if you're an artist in the entertainment industry today and you're not looking at UEFN, it's like, hey, that's that could be the future of uh, how you monetize your your skill set. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, you know, in terms of Epic's future, that's for them to say. But for us, you know, we've been working with them for the last couple of years. As soon as we heard what they were doing, we were all in right away. And we looked for what's the right ways that we can support them in this because we believe in it. I think I think the future would be very powerful because what you're building in Fortnite doesn't necessarily have to be games. I think I, I slowly started seeing showrooms. I slowly mm-hmm. started seeing education centers that you are bringing to Fortnite and now with all this asset, you don't have to be a 3D artist to create in Fortnite. Mm-hmm. Now you can create your own classroom, as simple as that, with, with different assets and then have people coming in. That's very interesting. I want to ask a question about how you transitioned from being a creative to an entrepreneur. What are the lessons that you had to learn and what are the things you had to drop? Because as a creative person, there are sometimes your focus is on something, and then when you become a businessman, you have to say, oh, it cannot be perfect anymore. I have to drop that. What were the skills that you had to learn and drop during this transition? Oh, man, so many. Um, yeah, there's that great phrase of what got you here won't get you there. Yeah. And I feel like that's a, a constant. Um, you know, in terms of the transition, I. I opened a visual effects studio in 2015, and I ran that for or maybe 2014, ran that for two years, uh, ran it straight into the ground um, because I came <laughs> at it as an artist and not as a business person. I didn't know anything about business um, other than like freelancing and best practices around that. Um, and so that was that was a huge learning experience, super painful learning experience, like made every mistake you could make in terms of starting a company uh, and then going through the process of closing down a company. Mm-hmm. Uh, from that, I, I really was determined to understand why it failed and the kind of curiosity of it, because it wasn't that we weren't busy. Uh, we did 50 projects in our first year and oh. did shows like Game of Thrones and you know, League of Legends and, you know, big properties, uh, but we couldn't turn a profit. And so I really started studying uh, business and starting to realize how much I had overemphasized the creative that, you know, as a creative person, you think creative is the most important aspect of it. Yes. Uh, And it's like, well, that's one aspect of it. And every aspect is important. Um, but it's not the only one. And I think over the years, you know, I've, I've had to drop a line, you know, I'm, I'm not the creative person at Kitbash. Uh, that's just not my role here. And it can't be if this company is going to scale and move towards accomplishing our mission of enabling and inspiring others. So, uh, you know, from the beginning, I thought I was going to do every cover for every kit that we released. <laughs> and that was one thing where I was like, oh, I'll just do, you know, two weeks a month. I'll spend doing the covers. And Banks luckily uh, slapped some sense into me of like, <laughs> that's just not possible. Yeah. Uh, and it's just been a, a series of that over the last seven years of something that uh, I'm doing that I realize I'm becoming a choke point here. This needs to be delegated. We need to find someone else to do this and more and more getting all of those things um, into the hands of people who are A, better at it than I am, uh, Mm -hmm. and B, can focus on it and give it their full attention uh, Mm -hmm. and letting me more and more and banks more and more step into the the conductor seat of let's just make Mm -hmm. sure that this whole organization is headed in the same direction, moving towards where we want to be, that we have the resources that we need to get there, um, and that our team is growing both personally and professionally, 
uh, and that the, the, the scale is growing responsibly. Oh, absolutely. No, sorry, you wanted to say no, something. No, I wanted to ahead. ask when you mentioned that delegating the task to people who can do it A, better than you, two, that they can have the focus. As a creative person, was it hard in the beginning to trust and to give the task to that let is go. so dear to you, so the creative task to someone else? So much. Yeah, it's the hardest thing. It still is the hardest thing. Um, and especially in the beginning when it's like we didn't have any money to pay anyone who had any experience with this stuff. So like, yeah. That's, yeah that, no, that's, that's always so fucking hard as well because you want to get somebody who is better than you, right? But then how do you balance that out? Again, it, it's such a tough thing. Yeah, you know, in the beginning and the way to do that for us was find someone who's hungry to get better at it. And maybe they don't start better than you, but if they give it their full attention and they're learning constantly, um, then they're going to get better than you. It's, it is a matter of time at the end of the day, right? Because even if you, th- if you are better over a long time, if you are giving your time to marketing, if you're giving your time to engineering and all these different departments, at the end of the day, whoever's spending the entire time on a specific skill creatively, then eventually they'll be better than you. And I think that's that's the entire reason why it's good to delegate. And knowing that you have to let go at some point is, is really important. You did mention that for uh, a, a few specific roles. Uh, wait, I'm trying to remember what I wanted to say. It just slipped my mind. <laughs> Sorry. No, I can I can take another uh, quote that you had in another podcast, which I find it really interesting. You mentioned that people started email you and asking you for mentorship, oh, and then good. you asked them that if they want that mentorship position, they need to send you ten paintings in ten weeks. Not a single person sends you anything. And that shows how people, they say what they want, but they actually don't want to work hard towards that direction. So I I really want to take your uh, opinion on this of why do you think people wouldn't want to spend, because 10 paintings in 10 weeks is not a big ask to, to have someone to be mentored. Especially when you're asking to do it for a living. Yes. That's what it's going to be. You're going to be doing them every week. Yeah. And you still couldn't get any, right? No, no. Um, And it's hard to find people who really want it. You know, Mm -hmm. that's not an easy thing. Uh, A lot of people will say that they really want it, but the day-to-day reality of going after something that you want, uh, it's not pretty. You know, Mm -hmm. there's, it's, it's a lot of, um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of challenges that you have to overcome. It's not necessarily fun or pleasant in the moment it's you know for anything that you're trying to accomplish that is going to be really gratifying the road there probably isn't going to be very smooth Hmm. um i want to talk a little bit about cargo because that is definitely one of our favorite things about what you guys have done when did you guys exactly launch cargo itself we launched may of uh last year 2023 which which is amazing again we've used it uh mostly with unreal And it works like a charm. And I'm just trying to understand one thing. Before Cargo, we had to buy the kit separately. Am I right? So you'll you'll look at a kit that you like and you can buy it. Whereas now, you can go ahead and pay for Cargo Pro, which is about $99. And then you'll get access to everything as long as you're, you're, you're on a monthly subscription. Yep. So what I want to know is, this is more like a business question. Because me and Farhad were talking to this team about... I would say six, seven months ago, they had an amazing product and they were asking us about our advice because we were using the products as a beta tester and they were asking us about, you know, if they should go for a membership model or if they should be charging, you know, a specific fee per per product that they were releasing. And we told them because of how people are psychologically just used to, you know, paying a subscription now to Spotify or Netflix and just having access to the entire library, it seemed like it would be the best choice as an artist, that I, that's what I would usually go for. What made you guys decide to go for that different model? And also, did you guys see a huge difference in the community and how they responded to Cargo Pro? Yeah, um, we always wanted to move towards this model and it made sense for us too as we're ramping up our releases, for example. You know, a single kit is $200. If we're putting mm-hmm. out two a month, um, 
it's kind of hard for most artists to keep up with all of that. Um, mm. So we thought this would be a better model. We have both, right? You can still come and buy a kit on Kitbash. If you want to subscribe, you want access to everything, you can subscribe. Um, a, a big part of this was we've always operated like a SaaS company. We've always operated like a subscription. You know, it's always been about developing a long-term relationship with someone and supporting someone. Even if you buy a kit once, we've done free updates every year for the last six years to everyone's wow. kits. Um, and so I think that made more sense for us just in terms of our mentality here. And our thought was mm -hmm. uh, if someone's willing to go on the ride with us, that gives us the ability to invest even more in them. Uh, and mm -hmm. so knowing that, hey, we're gonna have this many subscriptions next month allows us to make bigger bets, allows us to build bigger tools, help more. Uh, and so it really was for how do we make longer term investments? How do we make bigger bets on the types of tools we wanna bring to this community? Yeah, no, I mean, I'm just saying that as a personal opinion, I love that move that you guys made. Again, just as an artist myself, having full access to everything, I'm willing to go for that membership because I know I can go in at any time and just try out different things. And since that's what kit bashing is all about, right? You're going in and you're testing in with different assets. I think that was a brilliant move and it's, and it's very exciting. you want to see how you can use different assets from different kits, yes. right? Yes. That would be much more pleasant for an artist because today you are working on a project, tomorrow the project might be different mm -hmm. or you are working on a project with different clients, which they have different needs. Yeah. So I think that way would make a lot of more sense for the creators as well. Yeah, I mean, Cargo just in, in general, we, we believe this is just a better way to work of mm -hmm. you know, being able to search the entire library rather than pulling through kits to try to find something that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's taken us years to get to a place where uh, you can just import any asset with one click into your software, have everything set up for you, all the materials set up, all the geometry set up. Um, you know, when we launched, we didn't have textures, we didn't have materials. It was just FBX files and it would take an artist maybe a day to prep a kit to be able to yeah. use it for a scene. And so every year, similar to, hey, we wanna do kit releases monthly, we wanted to do updates every year to try to bring down, and we were specifically measuring the time to render. How long does mm -hmm. it take someone when they get a kit from us to when they get to click render? And just every year, can we shave off a couple hours? And, wow. and you guys have done a marvelous job at that. Because again, when we tried it out, it, it just doesn't feel like it's a long time. So yeah, it's, it, it, it's pretty well. How do you guys define the pipelines? Because I mean, of course, we use it for Unreal. There is Blender, Cinema 4D, other 3D softwares. And to make an asset that works in all of them, you guys had to go through a lot of testing. And yeah. do, do you guys still practice on your pipeline? Or this is something that you guys have built. It's working now. And you don't have to worry about it. Or no, every update, Suffers something get is updates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no way. We're always working on the pipeline. And there's always new technology coming out. Um, you know, we've spent many years building relationships and becoming partners with every major 3D software and render engine in the industry. Um, around 2018, Banks and I were at Pixar when they were showing us their first version of USD. And okay. both of us mm -hmm. looked at that and said, this is the future. Um, how, do we, how do we build for this? And it wasn't ready at the mm -hmm. time. So we worked with them and built KSD, Kitbash Scene Descriptor, that was mm -hmm. kind of on a parallel track to USD to say like, this will hold this over for now, um, to be able to basically hold all the data that's needed for every software and render engine in one format. Mm -hmm. And uh, over the last year or two, USD has gone leaps and bounds. And so because we had a parallel track and we were developing in tandem with them, we were able to just jump back over to the USD track with you know minimal mm -hmm. work. Um, but yeah, it's it's, you know, not an easy thing. It's been many years of development. Uh, we have an internal tool called Echo that processes everything. Uh, we're always working on Echo. This year we're working on Echo version seven and we built all the importers and exporters for every 3D software. So your cargo mm -hmm. plugin is basically a USD importer, um, but it's a, a homemade USD importer that's built around Kitbash's schema. Um, 
And right when we load in, if you download a file from Cargo, you can load that same file into Cinema 4D with Redshift and Unreal mm -hmm. 5. It's the same file. Uh, and our importers are automatically building all of your materials. They're building up you know, any instancing and creating your geometry exactly how you'd expect if you're a C4D user versus an Unreal user. So that's really cool. Technically, you, you were giving people USD, USD file when they're using cargo without them knowing it, right? It's like they are already use, using the latest yeah. file system technology. That's great. Yeah, it's our way of kind of sneaking it in and being like, you know, USD isn't so scary. <laughs> um, but also, like when we look at USD, we said, hey, this solves a big challenge for us. But from a creator standpoint, I don't think anyone cares what file no. format they're using. They just want something that works and holds the data. So mm -hmm. uh, we think Cargo is the way to do that, where make the file invisible, you know, yes. put it around an interface, easy to search what you're looking for, click and import it. And then underneath the hood, let's have all of that, you know, complexity of, you know, how are we going to transfer V-Ray materials into Redshift materials? Mm -hmm. And how are we going to split this out for, you know, Unreal and where does that go and Nanite and collisions and all that stuff. It's just like, yeah. get that out of an artist's way. And you know how you know something has to go? It's, it's quite simple. When we were doing the Unreal Engine beginner tutorial series, whatever you're trying to teach to beginners and you know it doesn't even matter, it's pretty easy to tell, okay, that part, it has to be fixed. Like when we're bringing in different file formats, FBX, like FBX GLB, and GLB, GLTF. and like you bring in the FBX, it doesn't have materials. You bring in the GLB, it's packed with materials. And you're like, okay, beginners don't really have to go through all this. This has to be automatic because the part they care about is coming in, hitting the physics button, and then boom, it drops, like it works. That's what they are interested in. That's what matters, not how they're importing in all these hundred different check check marks which is why again going back to cargo it's it's as easy as drag and drop and that's why it is so useful so the fact that it's usd very cool didn't know that that's awesome now my question came back to me i i don't know why it slipped my mind i wanted to ask you this not many creatives working in different industries especially i would say in a hard working environment which is usually the case as well nowadays when you go on x you see people talking about harsh working conditions they always say they want to do something for themselves. They want to work on their own. They want to do their own thing, maybe have their own business. You have done that. And you said that you failed actually in, in one of the endeavors that you had, probably even more. I, I, we don't know the entire story, but you have now Kid Bash 3D, which has become extremely successful. When you look at a person or an artist now, and if they come to you for advice, how can you tell if that person has got what it takes and they actually are somebody who will be right to be an entrepreneur versus somebody who should just stay being a creative because it's just not in their character because it's not for everybody. Yeah, it definitely is not for everybody. It's <laughs> <laughs> I can see the pain in your <laughs> eyes. Yeah. I can see the pain in your eyes. It's all flashback in front of his eyes. <laughs> like yes, all these years. <laughs> yeah. I, one of the, the things um, we say often is had we known uh, how hard it was going to be, we probably never would have done it. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it really comes down, for me, it comes down to grit and also mm -hmm. understanding why do you want to do this? Like, if it's money, there's so many better ways to go get money. <laughs> like this, this is a real dumb way to do this. Um, you're going to be yes. the last one paid forever. You know, like... <laughs> yes. This is yes. <laughs> it's no fun. Yeah. Yeah. And also like if you're an artist like and you're go you're there for money it's like why aren't you in fintech or finance? Mm. Like go get close to a dollar source. That's how you make money in the easiest fastest way. Not that that's not intense, but that's what it's optimized for. Um mm. you you have to be really clear on why you're doing it. And if I can understand that from someone, that lets me know is this a reason that they're so they have so much conviction or passion behind that they're going to go through the challenges and you know get kicked down a couple times and say it doesn't matter I really believe in this and I'm going to get back up and keep doing it. You know there's a there's an anime we watched together Chainsaw Man. Was it Chainsaw Man? Chainsaw Man. Yeah, yeah. Chainsaw Man. So you have to go 
if in order to get powers, you go to this place where they're holding all the demons, and then the bigger the power, the bigger the demon, and the more when you go through you that door, sacrifice. you'll have to sacrifice something to get that power. It's either a part of your body, someone might lose their eye, their arms, and the 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 higher the power, the more stronger the power, the more you'll have to sacrifice. And I genuinely believe. If you become an entrepreneur, this is a great power, a great responsibility because you're, like you say, if you're managing 60 people and you're enabling hundreds of thousands of artists, that is a great power. It's a great responsibility. But at the same time, you're going to be sacrificing a lot, a lot more than if people just want to make a lot of money. Again, like you said, there are much easier ways to do it. So I agree with you when you say that. And the way you said it was also beautiful. So thank you for that. Yeah, I think, you know, you brought up cargo and it's a perfect example of this, of, you know, what you see of, you know, you use cargo and you're like, hey, luckily, like, you like it, you like the workflow, it's seamless, it makes sense to you. And, um, you know, that's that's kind of the um, in front of the curtain. And then there's the behind the curtain, which is we started working on cargo in 2018. Um, and I thought it was going to come out summer 2019. And we built it three different times and scrapped it three different times before we built this version. Um, We ran into every problem imaginable. And, you know, we released an early access in 2022. And it was an early access for two months before we realized it was so broken that we had to go re-architect the entire thing from scratch. Oh, my God. Um, So, you know, and even what's out there today is like, I'd say 75% of what we scoped for a V1 release. So, um, you know, in that time, we put out 20 updates in the last nine months to start to get closer to where we wanted this to be when it launched. Uh, And so that's the stuff that you don't see that's behind the scenes uh, that we're always, you know, struggling with and dealing with. And, you know, hopefully from the outside, you go, wow, this is a great tool. and, And that's all you think. So the two times or three times that you guys build cargo and scrap, that is all R&D cost for yes. the company, right? Yeah, and it's not like we had that much to it. I mean, we've been building our kits team up. That's our main business yeah. model. So cargo has been in the behind the scenes. And so, you know, we've had a, an amazing team of uh, engineers, like four engineers that have been working simultaneously on our Echo pipeline to make the kits better and get these releases out each year. And then when they're not working on that, working on cargo. Um, and then, you know, I've been the UI designer and product manager of cargo for the last four years um, and building prototypes and doing, you know, user run throughs like, hey, just show me what you would do on this and, <laughs> you know, things like that. So it's, it's been a very small team, but like that team couldn't have even done it if it weren't for everyone else on the team who's giving us the cover to say like we're going to make sure that kits are coming out every month we're going to make sure that our marketing campaigns are running really well to continue to fuel this thing because we believe that this is the next evolution for us it's like you guys were running a software company underneath while the all the creative stuff was coming out all of this is happening and just like farhad said i was about to say that as well you're running this for it, you wanted it out in a year and they took, what, three, four years for it to come out. So all this time then goes back to what you were talking about, patience, right? And another thing is, I think a lot of creatives, again, going back to my last question, a lot of creatives say they want to do their own business, but they're not ever willing to actually let go of the creative work. The fact that you said you were working on UI, UX, this is not matte painting anymore, right? You have to be willing to switch your jobs. And you even said it in another podcast that, you loved your headphone time and you don't get that anymore. You don't get to listen to the podcast and listen to music like you used to do. And I agree with you. That is an enjoyable yes. time. We were working on a, on a cinematic, which is not even out yet, uh, using Darth Maul. And I had to paint over his body. And while I was doing that, I listened to three podcasts. And then after that, since about a month and a half ago, I haven't had time to do that at all. And I missed that specific day that I used to do that. So now that you said you've done that for many, many years and you don't have access to that anymore, you know, all these things I think people neglect when they're thinking about starting something on their own. These are things that they have to consider and they are very precious as well, honestly. Yeah, you know, I, I'm always torn on this idea of like inspiration versus uh, discouragement because, you know, I actually think the discouragement is probably more important to the person who's actually going to do it 
Um, I never want to discourage anyone. I want to inspire people, yeah. you know, but when I think mm -hmm. about if we're talking about someone who's going to go on an entrepreneurial journey, that's the person who's going to see every reason not to do it and then choose to do it anyways. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's what it actually takes because that's what the road looks like the whole time. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think it's a wonderful thing. I love my job. I would not trade it out for anything in the world. Like I absolutely love doing this. Um, uh, but I think that's the important thing that it's not an easy thing to do. And there's a lot that happens behind the curtain that, um, you know, isn't pretty or, or fun in the day to day. Mm. Yeah, hundred. If it was easy, I think cargo would be released on the first year when you guys have decided it. But another aspect of looking at what you guys have done at Kitbash 3D is really putting out both software and creative at the same time. So, so it's, it's technically something that people can use and creatively something really great that people can you know enjoy using it in their cinematics or in the things that they are making. How do you balance out between again the technical side? and the creative side? When do you say that, okay, the software, uh, we've been working on it for this long, it's enough because of the financial reason, because of the R&D that we are doing, I have to be firm on this. Do you get to you know, make those decisions that is really hard as a technical and creative person? Yeah, it never gets to 100%. I think that's something you have to let go of when you're running the business is like, I mean, you do that as a creative too, right? There's a deadline. And you do your best that you can around the deadline. Um, you know, at Kipesh, we have a little more freedom to say, you know what, we're going to push the deadline, but we can't do that that many times. We, we only get, that, uh, get to play that card a few times. So choosing when the responsible times to use that is. Um, but also, you know, for Cargo, when that released, that's V1. You know, this is not the finish line. This is not, hey, we're done with this. This is, hey, we believe that this brings enough value to creators that it's worth getting in their hands and beginning to learn from them and get their feedback to incorporate. Uh, but this is a, a, a constant thing, just like two kits uh, a month or one kit a month, now a cargo exclusive and now a Fortnite kit a month. Mm -hmm. Same mm -hmm. thing, we're doing an update to cargo every month. Um, and mm -hmm. it's that consistency that we believe that you know, if we do that every month and give us a couple of years on this, we believe cargo is going to just become more and more powerful, be able to pro uh, solve more and more problems and, um, mm -hmm. you know, be able to add more value and help creators more. Have you guys ever considered anything with relation to AI? Just, I, I think this is a discussion that everybody has. And I feel like Every month, the answer might change because things are moving quickly. Oh, six it's, months ago, everybody was so hyped about it. And, you know, it was... Everyone's like, okay, ChatGPT is going to take over. And then, in my opinion, ChatGPT got dumb. I don't know what they did to it, but it felt like it was it was going to take over. And then suddenly, it's answering my questions wrong. It, it's, it feels like a cycle. And right now, I feel like the hype is sort of dying down. In, 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 and I, for good reasons as well, because you don't, I don't think that hype was healthy to have, you know, all the time. So I want to know your thoughts when it comes to, to artificial intelligence and the role it's going to play with, uh, with Kitbash 3D. Yeah. Um, no matter what, I believe AI is here to stay and it's an incredibly mm. powerful technology and it would be irresponsible to run a business right now and not be looking at how to leverage it. Mm -hmm. um, Kitbash, historically, in general, like we don't make fast pivots around headlines. We just don't do it. Mm -hmm. um, we had the, similar things happen like when NFT boom happened, where every week I was being asked, what's Kitbash going to do in the NFT world? And it was like, well, I, and I'm not saying that NFTs aren't valuable and they're not a technology mm -hmm. that's here to stay. Uh, but for us, it was like, well, there's nothing we're going to do today on this, but we're going to watch the technology and look for, does it make sense in the direction that we're headed? We're not going to change directions because of a headline. Um, mm -hmm. I feel the same way with AI. Like We're not going to suddenly change directions just because AI is in the headlines, but we are looking at the technology and saying, um, how do we leverage this to solve creator problems? And how do we leverage this in order to enable and inspire people? So I think there's a whole world of possibilities. I don't think there's been a lot of AI tools that have been targeted towards professional creators right now. 
Mm -hmm. I think that's a giant hole in the space. I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for us in that hole to say, hey, what are the pain in the ass things that you have to explain to someone <laughs> in a tutorial that you know aren't the creative aspects of a job that AI can do? Um, mm -hmm. You know, whether that's how do you manage your own assets and have it automatically recognize the assets and auto tag them so that you can find them more easily, or smart assets where hey, there's a medieval table, so it knows that. Uh, medieval goblet goes onto the table like these are smart arrangements of assets because the AI knows like hey this is what these things what goes together and how they're arranged mm -hmm. you know things that more make a workflow seamless and empower people rather than a lot of the AI tools today which are doing that for non-professional creators saying yeah. I've never been able to draw or paint or use 3D or do any of these things, but I can write and explain my idea and now I can see it. Mm. It's a wonderful mm. empowerment that that is going to them. We're looking at the other side. Who's who's the professional creators? How do we enable them? You know, the only reason I asked that question was because if there was to be an AI trained on 3D content, I would like for it to be trained on Kitbash and, and created by Kitbash because I, I don't know who I was talking to about this. It, w it wasn't you. I don't know if we were having the conversation with no, somebody no, together. No, many times it was on the podcast when we talked about AI generated content for 3D. Mm -hmm. The reason our guest, one of them, CEO of Polycam, and the other guest mentioned that the reason it would be very difficult for AI to tr to generate 3D content is there are no references. Yeah. If you no, look at not enough good references yes. compared to 2D content. So if you look at photos and videos, there are thousands, millions, billions of them on the internet, but 3D yeah. assets, we don't have that many. Because if you, if you were to collectively look at all 3D assets, how much of them are, are, are created with you know, the right amount of polygons or the right textures, right? Compared to 2D where we have you know, the largest library of. So that's why, because the only 3D generation I know is from Luma Labs. We tested it. There are times where it has a few good 3D models, but then people are always worried about the polygons or just the way they're created. Sometimes the textures are all messed up. It really depends. It's definitely not ready, but it's good, as you mentioned, to look at it and see where that could go potentially in five, 10 years time. But again, if there is to be an AI generated model, I want it to be within the cargo plugin where I can go and say, okay, within this kit, this, these are the ones that I want. Now I want to create one that looks a little bit like this. That would be the coolest thing. I, I, I don't know. Maybe that would happen. We're definitely looking awesome. at it. Um, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. But I, I want to know what's next for Kitbash 3D. So we saw the vehicles that you guys released. Mm -hmm. Again, amazing posters. And that is going to be a monthly release, right? In the vehicle section. So that's going to be super interesting. Do you guys have anything else planned? We talked about also Fortnite. So that's something interesting too. Yeah, uh, there's there's quite a bit that I can talk about. There's a lot I can't talk about. Um, <laughs> for, yeah, in terms of, of kits, uh, yeah, the vehicles line is, is a, a big one for us. Um, they're just so cool. I'm, I'm so excited for a lot of those because I think to date it's only been real world vehicles, but um, being kit bash, you know, there's so many genres to explore with that. Um, so yeah, that'll be consistent releases. We'll continue to put out amazing kits every month. Uh, we have Fortnite kits that um, will be coming soon. I don't have a, a date to announce yet for that, but um, that'll be a really fun new product line for us with really, really fun styles and just very different from anything we've done in the past. Um, for Cargo, we're working hard on Mac development. Like we want to get Cargo on oh, for Mac. Okay. It's like number one most requested thing and, and we're working on that now. And then again with Cargo, like we've only scratched the surface. This is the the very, very beginning of Cargo. Uh, there's so much we want to do to, the, uh, to it. Um, yeah. And I think if we look at a longer time horizon, you know, really we want to solve asset management, um, not just for the Kitbash library, but for anyone so that they can utilize our internal tools and pipelines in order to um, easily be able to store everything in a USD format, easily be able to search anything that they've ever created and import it into any 3D software and really make that interoperability problem a thing of the past. Um, mm. So I think that's where we're going in the long term. and. If I were to say like the 
the vision that I have for the next couple years. It's really this idea that, you know, not only does Kitbash provide so much that any creator needs, but that we enable other people to provide their assets to creators. So mm -hmm. if you were to think about it, like Ford builds a Mustang, they design it in 3D, 3D files go to the manufacturing floor, usually get rebuilt for the manufacturing floor, gets sent over to the commercial agency, usually gets rebuilt for the commercial agency, ends up in Forza, rebuilt for Forza. That yeah. same car is built minimum four different times. Um, our pipeline, we hope, can actually solve that and say, hey, Ford, you designed this car this way, that same file using this pipeline goes to manufacturing, goes to the agency and goes to Forza. And you know what, it's in Fortnite. So if someone wants to create an experience around the new Mustang, it's yeah. there. And how do we connect that entire ecosystem together? That, that is really powerful because no one wants to use those AutoCAD files. Yeah, <laughs> no, that that is going to be a complex problem to solve. And one that probably takes years, probably longer than what you guys will have to expect. But again, once you guys solve that, you guys have basically solved one of the biggest problems in 3D when it comes to asset management. I have I have one more question. Do you, do you want to no, go? Okay. You, okay. Go you mentioned the one of the most requested... Uh, operating systems was Mac and you, you mentioned how that was something that you wanted to bring on. I want to just ask one question. I don't know if this is something you can share, but when you guys go to Cargo, you have the option to go to Unreal, Blender, you know, Maya. Which softwares, uh, I might say plural, were the most requested amongst the community? This is the question that every 3D artist has because they're always planning to know which software they should go to next, where, the most where most of the community is spending their time. Now that you guys have access to all these different communities, which softwares are the most requested to get access to to cargo and all the the assets and and all that? You know, it really changes based on what someone is trying to do. And so, mm -hmm. with Kitbash, we service a lot of different types of creators, and um, we service a lot of studios. We work with over twelve hundred studios right now, and studios wow. are. You know, very much Maya 3ds Max centric. A lot of them are moving into Houdini more and more. Like that's become a growing mm. um, pipeline for studios, and so those three are, are the staples there. Uh, so mm -hmm. I would say, you know, if you're a creator and you want to work at a studio, like a AAA game studio or a visual effects studio, um, those are the three. Um, and I would, it changes based on what you're trying to do, but if it's film visual effects, it's probably Maya and Houdini. Um, right. Then we have the independent freelancers doing commercial work, motion graphics, illustration work. Uh, they're using Cinema 4D. Like C4D mm -hmm. is, it's an amazing tool and it's really around a one person army. How do you give a 3D mm -hmm. software that can equip one person with every tool in order to do a task? Um, and it's a very professional grade software. Uh, Unreal and Blender, uh, they're free. And so there's a lot of education around them. Um, Blender is open source, so it's developing really fast. It's getting more and more powerful every year. You know, when we started Kitbash, one of our first kits was uh, built in Blender. And I remember going, who the hell is using Blender? You know, <laughs> and the, the artist showed me what he was doing and i just was like mind blown it was the first time i ever seen someone using blender for a professional job um today you know totally different world if you are a concept artist you're probably using blender if that's what you want to go mm -hmm. towards you should probably use blender um you want to make your own animations uh and film visual effects like blender is a great option for that and then unreal mm -hmm. you know i don't think there's any comparison it's just it's the industry standard, virtual production's moving there, AAA game creation mm -hmm. is there, more and more cinematics are there. It's free. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, sorry, that's a long-winded answer, but no, it's all to no, say no, there no, isn't a wrong choice. There's a what's the right choice definitely. for what you're trying to do. I, I was thinking that now you mentioned all these different industries. So, I mean, it's obvious that animations, movies, video games, even commercials, they're all using Kitbash 3D. Were there any industry that, you know, started using Kitbash that you guys shocked that, you know, they were using it like, oh, I didn't know our asset could be used in that industry. Totally. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think 
Early on, a lot of concerts started using Kitbash for the concert graphics, and that was a surprise right. to us. Um, and since then, we, you know, they've used Kitbash assets for Taylor Swift and Childish Gambino and Travis Scott and all of these like big name musicians. That kind of took us by surprise. Um, the fashion industry was using Kitbash for like digital runway shows, which um, right. also we just didn't expect. Um, I think it was it was a lot of years ago, but the first one was Rag and Bone, and I remember seeing the runway show for Rag and Bone, being like, "I never thought our kits were going to be used like this." <laughs> um, this looks familiar. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, technology. You know, technology companies are using it a ton, whether it's Meta or Apple or um, Nvidia, and I'm seeing that in like their tech demos, which makes sense of like. Hey, we're trying to push a technology thing. We need a bunch of assets to stress test it or to, to show what we're doing. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, a lot, lot of surprises. But I also think this is just again like the very beginning. I think it, over the next five years, we're going to see every industry start to incorporate more and more three D. Yeah, I mean, it, it goes back to how you said that three D content is going to be the next medium, and genuinely, I believe that every company is slowly gathering 3d artists right even smaller companies are now bringing in 3d artists to do some of the animations to even do work for, on their websites right because websites now are running 3d assets as well and so the fact that every 3d artist is eventually going to know about kitbash 3d i think it is no surprise that you will see kitbash assets at some point in during in, in different industries and we're going to see more of that i just want to say that after this conversation I'm looking forward the most to those Fortnite assets because you Same. said they look different than the things that you guys have seen on Kitbash, the usual ones. So you guys have so many different fucking genres. I'm trying to imagine what that would even look like. So I am looking forward to that. And I've learned so much, Max. So thank you so, so much for your time. Thank you for sharing all this beautiful information with us. And I hope everybody in the audience also enjoyed it as well. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, it's been great chatting with you. No worries, man. Again, thank you. And for everybody watching and listening, we'll leave all of the description, the links to everything we talked about down here below. So make sure you guys check it out and we'll see you guys next week. Ciao. Ciao.